So you talk about an elimination diet, and that sounds scary to lots of people, and there's lots of variations on the elimination diet. Mm -hmm. So give me, let's, let's, let's go easy here. Give me, give me the four one rather than the eight one. How's that? Uh, yeah, it's good. And then <laughs> thank you for the kind words. I love, my passion is seeing patients. And uh, just like you, we wouldn't replace it for, for the world, for sure. Um, and the, so the core four are grains. So that's going to be the gluten-containing grains as, all, as well as the gluten-free grains. Uh, and then the second would be dairy. The third would be added sugar and four would be high omega-6 oils, these uh, industrial seed oils like canola oil. So that's the core four. So for that plan, we, do, we remove those foods for four, week, for four weeks, um, and we have a step-down chapter as well for people that want to lean into it. Um, and then they go four weeks with removing them, and then we have a systematic reintroduction that we do to see, let's test it for ourselves. Maybe we feel fine with certain grains, but not with other grains. Maybe we do fine with certain types of dairy and not with other dairy, which you highlight very well in your books. And so on and so forth as you go through these foods that were eliminated. So that's the core four. So do you have any plan for, okay, so I've done that, I feel better. And in fact, most people definitely feel yeah. better. Mm. What do you like to bring back first? As you know, uh, I, in you know, phase three of my programs, I start reintroducing some lectin-containing foods. Mm -hmm. And again, find out you know, what ones you react to and what you don't. Mm -hmm. uh, any you like to start with, have you found through the years? What I recommend for in the book is for patients or the reader, uh, <laughs> patients are all I have my context for this, but the reader, uh, for them to look on that list and see what they actually miss. Because some people, maybe they don't miss any of those foods and they feel so amazing that they're like, what, I don't even miss these, I don't even wanna bring these back. And then we know, obviously, there are some people that are like, I really miss food X, whatever that, that food is, and they want to test that in. So if they want to bring it all back in, that's fine, but I have the conversation in the book to say, what do you really want to have? Because these aren't like, necessarily things that you have to have on a regular basis, um, but if you want to, let's enjoy it. People should enjoy food, and if they miss something, let's try to bring it back in. I would say out of those, the core four, uh, I would say the dairy would probably be the most, uh, you know, Thing to try back in and start with the full fat dairies so things like uh, the creams and the uh, butters and fermented dairies like the kefirs and the yogurts start with those first and then you can go into and, and cheeses are a part of that as well and then after that you bring in the dairy and I am very specific in the book about what have I seen seeing patients what are the generally speaking the least problematic to the most problematic ending with conventional dairy being the, the, on the low end of that list of being what I've seen, what you see too, being the more problematic ones. Yeah, and you mentioned in your book, uh, if you're gonna reintroduce dairy, there, there certainly is for some people a difference in their reaction between casein A2 and casein yes. A1 milks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I appreciate you highlighting that in your book so well, because I think it's hit uh, masses in a way that people weren't aware of it before your book. So I give you credit for that. Well, thanks, thanks. Yeah. And thanks for mentioning it in your book. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, there are people who will absolutely react to all forms of dairy. And I know you have tests and I have tests now that can identify those people who mm -hmm. even casein A2 is a problem, right. or even whey is a problem, right. uh, which uh, has surprised me through the years mm -hmm. as these better tests have come out. Yeah. And I think some people intrinsically know uh, that they do react to dairy. Many of them don't want to believe that. <laughs> yeah. uh, because, yeah. um, you know, dairy, uh, there's some really cool compounds in, in milk that are morphine-like compounds, and they go right to your brain and go happy, 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 happy. Yeah. Uh, through the years uh, with my work with the ApoE4 gene folks, the quote Alzheimer's gene, a horrible term, but that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. These folks uh, really should not have a lot of saturated fats, particularly animal saturated fats. Yeah. And yet I used to laugh because I'd say well over 90% of my ApoE4s cheese is their favorite food and it's like kryptonite yeah and uh, i thought of doing a questionnaire what's your favorite food and then you know blindly look at their apple you know four and 
Yeah, so there is this component. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why quality. I think people want dairy back in their lives. Totally. Um, yeah. So, and, but some people are not gonna do it. No, they love their dairy. You're right, it is a love food. It's dairy and grains, and I grains. feel like the like, coveted food, food for many people. Well, yeah, because there's so many components in grains, particularly you know, wheat, that you know, are morphine-like compounds. Yeah. And a lot, yeah, let's talk about that. So yeah. in elimination diet, uh, I tell people you're gonna hate me for two weeks, <laughs> and then you're gonna start loving me. Yeah. Um, and I think the more and more I've done this now for 20 years, the more I think that it's this addictive quality of mm -hmm. grains, particularly wheat, yes. that they're withdrawing from an addiction. Totally. Do you, you see the same thing? I see the same thing in a lot of people. It's those, I, you know, there's different, the lectins, the wheat germ, gluten, and the WGA, and these other, it's like an opioid sort of opiate type reaction in the body. Um, and so I think it's a, for a certain sect of people, it is the protein sort of drug-like reaction that they're having in the brain. And the, I think the other peop, sect of addictive quality is the sugar. People are addicted to the sugar aspect of it and grains break down into sugar. Uh, and I think that when they're not getting that kindling on the fire, they get hangry and irritable and they need that fix again. Yeah. So I, I think it's both of those reasons uh, that makes it addictive for some people. And I think there's a third factor that you actually bring up in each one of your sections, and that's the emotional factor. Yes. Uh, you know, yes. so many of these we, associ we associate eating with family, mm -hmm. with comfort, yeah. and you have an emotional mantra or a mantra in each of your sections. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, you know, particularly coming from your, from your background, an important addition to all this that mm -hmm. most of us don't stress enough. You want, yeah. you want to talk to that for yeah. a minute? Yeah, I think it's easy that, you know, even I don't stress it enough. I think we all need to be as practitioners and just people should look at the mental, emotional, even spiritual component to that because it's very easy in our space to get caught up in the, the stuff that we see impacting people. We, we deal with the labs, we look at the measurements, we know if how food impacts people, we know the different protocols uh, from a clinical scientific standpoint of how to make people healthy. But then there's this more esoteric, ethereal, mental, emotional, spiritual component that impacts our physiology. So that was another thing that I wanted to uh, talk about during the elimination uh, s aspect of the book, because we're not just eliminating foods, because it's not just about foods. And uh, we have to look at stress, we have to look at social media addiction and, and our screen time, we have to look at poor sleep, we have to look at these sort of things that uh, can drive inflammation levels up as well. So it's not just about removing things. I also wanted to give people things to do, acts of stillness, acts of peace, acts of things that activate the parasympathetic system to lower inflammation levels. Um, so the mantra is part of that and different practices with that throughout the book people can lean into. Um, so it's definitely important, and I know that you see this too, is that people can have the foods down right but if they're you know, serving their body a big slice of stress every day or they're in a toxic work environment or a toxic relationship, those are things that people need to realize that's impacting their physiology too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in fact, in the longevity paradox, uh, it's so important when you look at long-lived people that mm -hmm. their social and spiritual practice, their network, yeah. is really you know a huge part of their of their success, mm -hmm. and yeah, you you can't stress that enough the, of this emotional component to yeah. to all of this. Yeah. Also, there's a fascinating paper you may have seen it on the effect of blue light on mm -hmm. longevity. And it turns out that exposure to blue light uh, from our fluorescent lights, from our cell phone, from mm -hmm. our computer, from our TVs, uh, now it's done in fruit flies, but hey, fruit flies are a really good model for longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, when fruit flies were exposed to 12 hours of blue light mm -hmm. uh, every day, they live significantly less, less long wow. than fruit flies who were exposed to less than that period of time. Wow. And, and it, they, 
could, even if they didn't see the blue light, but they were exposed to that spectrum. Uh, so you don't even have to see it. Just uh, your retinas are exposed to it, and it actually impacts your brain aging. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. I didn't see that study yet. Yeah, I'll uh, send it to you. Yeah, I want to see it. I, we see that obviously with patients a lot. Uh, that it's impacting their quality of life. It's impacting their sleep. It's impacting their stress levels, on so many levels. You know, so I, I do things like blue light blocking glasses. Um, there's different apps you can get download on your phone to prevent that blue light as well. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the apps are out there. Yeah, and people you know, just have to use them. Yeah, <laughs> you have to use them. And I just tell everybody, you know, buy a pair of the blue blockers that look like Bono, and you know, you'll be cool <laughs> yeah, watching the like TV. You and you and too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's, I mean, there's all. It's an easy way. Yeah, it's very easy. And it's something that none of us have really, you know, talked enough about. You're right. And you, you talk in your book a lot about these disruptors that I talk about in The Plant Paradox, and I call them seven deadly disruptors, and you've got a few more, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so give me a couple more examples of you know, how disruptors in our environment, in our foods, mm -hmm. have, have impacted us. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look at human genetics research estimates that our genetics haven't changed in 10,000 years, but look at the time that we're living in, just in our lifetime, how much has changed, just in the last 100 years, how much has changed, a lot of good stuff, a lot of advancements, people are connecting to us around the world, that's amazing, no one's taking that away from that. But the other side of the coin is that there's a growing disparity between our genetics, which remains unchanged for 10,000 years, and the world around us. So I think People in the space of wellness uh, are hopefully um, voices to this conversation of how do we strike a balance with where we're at right now in human history? How can we get the best of modernity without falling prey to these potential pitfalls and looking at our food supply, looking at environmental toxins, looking at what's happening to the soil, looking at technology and the impact that's having on our biochemistry. So I try to not overwhelm people in the book, but give people practical solutions to so say you, you don't have to live in a bubble, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to do all the things. You can, and th what I have found is for most people, if they just lean into these things, if they just do the best they can with the access they have, that's within their budget, with what they even have a vessel for to even receive or do right now, uh, just to lean into it, because you, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, in my first book years ago, I said, do, with, do what you can with what you got wherever yes. you are. Amen. Yeah. And you'll, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm.